thank you all um, for being here today for our first uh, virtual orientation leader rally. Um, we're going to be hearing a little bit about orientation tonight and a little bit more um, from the Office of Sustainability about what uh, sustainability on campus can look like. So we have a little bit of content for you and hopefully you all have some questions that we can answer and maybe get you a little more excited for coming to campus. Uh, before I hand it over to Kate, I'm going to introduce myself. You'll be hearing a little bit more from me throughout the night. Uh, my, my name is Tori Helms. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the assistant program manager for orientation at UVM. Um, I'm really excited to welcome you all in August, and I know that these sessions can sometimes be a lot, but we really want to make sure that you're prepared and welcome you um, in the best way possible. So um, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Kate. Hello. So my name is Kate. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a senior here at UVM. I'm also an environmental studies major, and I have been working with the Office of Sustainability through various programs and initiatives for all four of my years here at UVM. Uh, today I'm going to talk about waste on campus and food on campus and one of my associates, her name is Claire, will be talking about transportation afterwards. So we're going to start with food, I believe. So one of the programs uh, that the Office of Sustainability and Dining partner on is called EcoWare. And this program is the fact that students can come to dining halls and instead of eating in at the dining hall and, um, you know, getting plates there and eating food in the place, you can take a to-go container with you out of the dining hall. This is really helpful for students who have like short windows between classes, they need to eat on the go, or they have to like bring dinner with them to work, things like that. Um, it's very helpful because dining halls close at eight o'clock and stuff like that. So if you want to eat something later, you can bring something with. Um, but as a university who values uh, sustainability the way that we do, um, it was very important that we created this program so that you had that flexibility with your dining plan, but also that you were not using single-use container every time. So they're just plastic to-go containers, but they're uh, durable plastic. So you should not be recycling them. You should not be throwing them out. They are a loan take and return program. So I have here one of the key tags. I just keep it on my keychain here. Um, it's got a little coin in it. And the way it works is that when you come to school, you will go into the dining halls. You can ask some of the dining workers for one at the cash register um, or eco reps, which is a group of student leaders and hired by the Office of Sustainability. And they're hiring right now. If you're going to live on Trinity, you should apply. Um, you can find us on the Office of Sustainability website. Um, they'll be tabling and helping you get signed up for this program, which means they will give you one of these little key tags. And then whenever you go to the dining hall and you want to get EcoWare, then you will swipe your card for one of the unlimited meal plan little dine-in times, and you will hand them your key tag and they will hand you a container. Then you can go around and fill it up with whatever you want. And later on, you will bring that dirty container back to the dining hall and they will take the dirty container, they will run it through the dishwasher and you get a tag back. So you exchange it back and forth. It's pretty simple, um, but it's really important that we keep that return rate up because um, every every year we have to replace a number of containers because they get misplaced or they get stolen or they get um, put in the wrong places like left somewhere that they're going to be found and it doesn't work like that we don't have people patrolling looking for them so make sure you bring back your containers to a dining official location um so i've talked about them in the dining halls and it's also true you can use them at um retail locations i believe new world tortilla and skinny pancake which are two um dining locations that are run by like communal community restaurants they do not use EcoWare, but places like the Marketplace and the Marche, which are not dining halls, but they're run by Sodexo in the same, they have the same kind of um, food offerings. 
um, you can use EcoWare tags at those places. And at those places, you can get a discount every time you use EcoWare. It's only 25 cents, but that kind of thing adds up when you have, what is it, like 180 points for the semester? Like, yeah, like that means an extra milkshake for me, you know, if I use the EcoWare every time. So highly recommend getting involved in the EcoWare program. Um, and again, you can return dirty containers. You don't need to uh, clean them before you bring them back. So just we want we want to see them return to us so we can keep the cycles going. Um, I think that's the long and short of EcoWare. And I want to say I'm going to be here the whole time. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to like push put them to me. Um, and furthermore, you can email sustain at uvm.edu. And that is the Office of Sustainability kind of like hotline. So feel free to do that. Is there anything orientation leaders and such want me to go over about that before I move on to waste? No, I'm seeing shaking heads. Cool. All right. So the other thing I'm going to talk about is that at UVM we have compost programs within the res halls. Uh, so they are these little green bins. They have a orange latch on them so you can keep them closed and they're usually kept in um, common rooms on the main floor or near the entryway. Uh, they're different in every building, um, but all buildings have them pretty much. Uh, and that's really effective and nice because it means that when you cook in the dining, in the in the dorm kitchens and things like that, and peel an apple for apple pie or, you know, have leftover scraps because you, I don't know, trimmed something, I don't know, whatever. Um, you can You can put all those things in the compost bin, which is a huge, huge diversion of waste. So let me talk briefly about compost because it just occurred to me that some of you might not know what compost is. Um, compost is the process of turning organic waste into uh, usable soil and dirt. Uh, I believe it's CSWD is the name of the facility that turns our organic waste into compost and or into dirt and they sell it. It's a, it's a product for them. So we pay them to take away this organic waste for us. It diverts from the landfill and it ends up getting sold as a garden product, um, which is just like so much better than rotting in a landfill, which uh, another thing is that organic waste doesn't really rot in landfills. Landfills have a uh, sealants on top and stuff like that. So organic food can't decompose and process. It just stays there which is a handy thing about landfills, right? So basically by composting things, you are removing it from landfills, removing it from the waste stream, putting it towards something more effective, you know, encouraging that cycle of uh, decom decomposition and uh, reusing and resources and materials and such. Uh, so it's, it makes me feel good when I can put something in the compost. Um, and, it's basically only food scraps. You can put in meat and dairy products, which you have a home compost. You probably don't do that because it will attract bears, but you don't have to worry about that at a you know professional compost facility. They've got it, fences and stuff. But um, <laughs> so we have these bins. They get emptied out every few days by custodial. Uh, we try and keep them neat and clean, keep the lids closed so that there's no smell, but it's, it's really not that much of a big deal smell wise and things like that. Just put anything that would break down in there. Um, we do not allow paper products in our compost, which some of you have home, home compost might put like newspapers and cardboard and things in there. CSWD doesn't do that. So food and like plant matter only. Um, but it's a it's a fairly simple process and we've diverted a lot of waste. I don't remember any of the numbers off the top of my head, but um, it does take a little bit of getting used to for some people. Um, another fun thing about the compost is that if you live on the fourth floor of a residence hall and the bins are on the first floor, you're not going to want to go down there every time you eat a banana, right? So if you go to your res hall main desk where you would collect your mail usually, um, you can ask them for a compost bag and they'll give you just a little brown paper bag like a, this big, I guess. It just looks like a little brown paper bag and it says compost on it in green. And it has a plastic liner and it's a decomposable plastic and it basically is something you can keep in your fridge 
Um, and it, it won't smell bad, I promise, as long as you keep it in the fridge because it'll stay cold and it won't be a big deal. Um, and you just take it out once a week the same way you take out the rest of the trash in your dorm room. Um, and this is something you need to talk about with your roommate as well, because if you have if you like share a fridge, they might not want like apple cores in their fridge. But it's also something that most people are usually OK with because it doesn't smell. You take it out regularly as long as you're on top of it. It can be a nice feature for your room. Um, and that is a great way to continue composting despite living on the fourth floor or any kind of distance from compost bins. Um, there's also compost in the dining halls. Uh, and that's much easier, I think, because they're, they're right there in the same place you put your silverware and your used plates and your trash. And once again, paper products go into trash and recycling, whichever one is relevant. Food product goes into compost. Um, and that's pretty straightforward and well labeled in dining locations, I would say. I think the main goal here was to talk about it in the res halls because it's a little more confusing for residents. Um, I believe that's everything I'm supposed to talk about. Did anybody have anything else they were supposed to cover? Hey, Kate, could you talk a little bit about um, not having garbage bins around campus? OK, yeah, sure. So it's, it's actually a common complaint um, is that <laughs> we have lots and lots of trash and recycling bins, I promise, but they're all inside. And let me tell you a little bit about that because um, we live in Vermont and it snows in Vermont and it's also very windy in Vermont. So this is it's a little bit difficult to have regular all year round um, bins outside. I've actually spoken to several people about this issue and have heard some of the issues with the uh, up the chain, you know, like some of the obstacles and the bureaucracy of getting this to happen. Um, and I promise there is more than enough compost and more than enough trash and recycling. There's compost in the Davis Center, but there's not compost in regular academic buildings. Um, but you just need to step inside of a building to find them. So when you're walking around campus, don't be like, wow, there's like absolutely no trash bins. There are, you just need to take a second, step inside a building, they're usually right inside the door. Um, and I said that there's weather restraints that make this really difficult to happen. There's also labor constraints. Um, as with many places, there's, you know, uh, somewhat of a labor shortage, but also it's just like not cool to ask your custodial staff to walk out in the middle of a blizzard to empty a trash can, you know? So like we try and make it simple on them. We try and make it, you know, ask from our community, just walk inside a building to find your trash can. It keeps the place cleaner. That's the other thing is it's windy. So not only will it knock over bins, it'll also blow things out of bins. Having that volume of bins is just not necessary for the amount of waste that our campus generates. Having them inside is fine. So if you would rather choose to have them outside instead of inside, then like that, that's that's a different route to take there. But I think most people would prefer them inside, especially in the winter time. Um, I think that about covers it. Any other questions or thoughts on that? I'm seeing shaking heads. OK, so I guess I guess that ends my piece here. Thanks, thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, welcome to UVM. Thanks, Kate. Um, I think Claire, you're going to talk a little bit about transportation now. Yep. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Claire. So I've also been working with the Office of Sustainability for a bit now, and I'm the sustainable transportation intern for the university. Um, and basically what that means, transportation is like a scary word to a lot of people, but it's just like how you get from point A to point B. Um, so when you get to campus, I'm sure you're going to be super overwhelmed with the amount of things to do on campus. There's a lot. Um, and while you're exploring campus, you know, have a good time. That's great. But part of what we do is help you get around campus to experience those different things and then also get off campus because Burlington's a really cool place. There's live music. We have a beautiful beach. Um, we have really nice hiking trails around here, things like that. So how you get from point A to point B is kind of what what I focus on um, in my office. So uh, yeah, sorry, I'm just getting distracted by comments. Um, so 
One of the biggest things that we uh, promote in our office is bringing a bike to campus. If you don't have a bike or you're afraid of biking or you've had a bad bike accident or whatever has happened to you, that's totally fine. But if you do like bikes or if you're kind of new to them, we highly recommend bringing one. It makes it a lot easier to get around campus. We have storage for bikes in almost every residence hall. We have outdoor storage for bikes around all of our buildings. It's a very bike friendly campus. We have separated bike paths all throughout Burlington. Um, and right along the water, there's this one like, I think it's like 40 miles or something in each direction. This beautiful separated bike path that goes all along the water. It touches all the beaches. So like if you want to go have a bonfire with some friends, you can just bike down really quick and it's really easy. Um, so we really like bikes. If you don't have a bike, if you're like flying to campus or something like that, um, we have this awesome program called Green Ride Bike Share, which is all electric bikes. Um, there, we have a bunch of hubs around campus and you can pay an annual membership or you can just like check one out uh, when you walk up to the, the hubs or just bike racks where they stay. Um, but you can just check one out when you walk up to it or you can get an annual membership which is discounted for students. So it's only $50 a year which is like less than $4 a month and you get access to this electric bike that you can use to get wherever. Um, which is really cool. So check it out, Green Ride Bike Share, if anyone wanted to write that down. Um, GreenRideBikeShare.com, I think, is their website. Uh, so if you don't have a bike, we have these bikes available on campus. They're also available all throughout the Burlington community. This is kind of a local thing that UVM's partnered with Champlain, which is a nearby college for. Um, so that's a really, really cool opportunity too. We also, if you really like bikes, we have a UVM Bikes Co-op. Um, where you can work, you can learn how to fix up bikes, you can, you know, get your bike fixed by them for basically free. They only ask that you pay for any parts that they need to order. So all the labor costs are totally free, which is really cool. And they also rent bikes for $25 a semester, which is like the cheapest bike you will ever find. So that's UVM Bikes Co-op, um, if anyone's curious about that one. That's kind of my spiel on bikes, heavy proponent of bikes over here. Um, but also go to getting around campus, if you've looked at the campus map, which you can do at uvm.edu slash map, it'll show you um, a lot of more, more about the transportation around campus. So we have a campus shuttle that kind of goes between each of the campuses. So if you live really far away from the gym or something, you can just hop on the shuttle, it's totally free. And then you can take it across campus. You can look at like where the routes will take you and plan it out. Um, so the campus shuttle is really useful. You can also use the local bus system, um, which is called GMT, Green Mountain Transit buses. They're also really great. That's how you can get like downtown. That's how you can get to, you know, like neighboring places. Like we have this really cool city, Winooski, right next to Burlington. They have a bunch of, they have like this awesome vegan ice cream shop. They have, you know, music. They have this other, um, I'm vegan, but they have this awesome vegan um, place called Pingala, which is this great restaurant. They have this like beautiful little riverway, you know. So if you want to get around GMT, the buses are pretty great. They come typically about every 20 minutes. So you're not going to get trapped somewhere. Um, and there's a bunch of different lines. There's one that just loops around Burlington. So it's like pretty small route. Um, so you're not, you're not ever gonna get like dumped somewhere far away. Um, the buses here are pretty trustworthy and the bus drivers are really sweet people. Other cool thing about the local bus is that it's totally free. You just have a cat card. I'm not sure if you guys know about your cat cards, but it's, it's just like a little card that identifies you as a UVM student. You can use it to scan into buildings and things like that. When you get on the bus, you scan your cat card and it's totally free. UVM has covered the cost of every student riding the bus for free. So you've kind of already paid for it with your tuition, so we highly recommend using it. Um, it's also great, I'm not sure if, if people know this either, but UVM is situated on the top of a hill. So if you bike downtown, you don't need to ride back up, you can take the bus. That's, you know, and I've done it many times myself. I go down for sunset or something like that. I, I ride my bike down and then I take the bus back up. And all of the buses in Burlington also have bike racks on the front of them. So you can just put your bike right on the bus. Don't have to worry about lugging it in with you, you know. Um, so the bus system's really great. We also have a lot of commuter buses that come from really far distances. So if you're like trying to figure out how to get back um, for, 
winter or winter break or Thanksgiving break or something like that. We have so many bus lines that come in and out of Burlington and we have special contracts with certain bus lines so that you can get to your hometown just for breaks. They don't normally come to Burlington, but we've arranged it with the university. Um, so if you look up, I think it's called the long distance travel options for UVM. There's a whole web page that we have about this and the different bus lines that can get you places. Same thing with trains. Um, and then we also have an airport that's about 10 minute, 15 minute ride from the university if you um, want to fly in and out. And they don't go everywhere. You know, it's Burlington. It's not huge, but but they go a lot of places. Um, so let's see. Covered bikes, bus, train. Um, oh, yeah. And then um, we also have this thing called car share, which is exactly what it sounds like. If you need a car, if you need to get somewhere and you don't have a car, we have shared cars. Um, you can sign up for an annual membership and you basically just kind of just like pay for every trip that you take. I think it's an, an hourly fee or something like that. Um, and we have a discounted student membership for this too. But we have cars on campus that you can check out for, you can check them out for an hour if you just wanna go to the grocery store, or you can check them out for a few hours if you wanna go on a hike. You can check them out for a weekend if you wanna pop up to Montreal with some friends. Um, so you don't need your own car on campus. You can have this membership and you just pay, you know, when you use the car. Um, and we have two of these cars located across campus. I think we're getting, two more electric ones soon, which is pretty cool. Um, and then there's also like 20 other cars, part of this car share program that are scattered throughout Burlington. So you can, you know, kind of pick them up wherever. If the ones on campus are being used, you can go downtown and, and pick one of those up. Um, so if you feel like you need a car and that, that option is absolutely available for you. Uh, I think that's all of the transportation stuff. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I've been doing Claire, this for a while. What's up, Kate? I, I can note that in the chat, there's a direction, there's a question directed at you. What bike lock do you recommend? Oh yeah, um, U locks are definitely the best bike lock if you have one. There is bike theft around campus. It does happen. It happens anywhere that you're gonna go in any small city. Um, it's not a huge issue, but we heavily recommend U-locks just because they're harder to cut through. Um, and also, when you get to campus, we recommend that you register your bike. You And we help you do this. We'll have stations set up to help people with this. But basically, you just bring your bike over, you read um, like the identifying code on your bike, and then we take a picture of it and we put it into our system. So if it is stolen, you can be like, hi, my name is blah, 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 and my bike got stolen and I'm freaking out. And then we'll have our police services looking for it. Um, so that is another thing. I actually have one more question that I'm getting in the chat quite a bit, um, and it's about the extent of the buses. So um, the question is, are there buses to ski resorts or shuttles for skiing anything on campus? Because that's coming up a bit. Yeah, totally. So um, yeah, skiers and snowboarders, big thing at UVM. Um, we have ski buses run through the UVM Ski and Snowboard Club. Uh, so if you don't know about that, it's pretty cool. You should look it up. Um, but they have ski buses that you can sign up for I'm pretty sure it's it's totally free. Um, yeah, I'm getting nods, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, cool. It's totally free. Um, and they go to specific uh, resorts. So like if you have a, a sugar bush pass or a smuggler's notch pass or something like that, um, they have specific buses that go to specific resorts and they you know leave in the morning and then they'll take you home um, in the afternoon. You can also use the car share cars to get to um, the mountains if you need if you don't have a car on campus uh you can use those whenever you want um there are the gmt buses that i know of don't take you directly to any of the ski resorts um but i think that they they do get you kind of close to them uh they can get you into like nearby towns and things like that so but i, I don't, i've never seen someone use them to get um like to the mountain itself uh yeah, that's that. Um, what was the other I question? I have a, a couple more for you while yeah, I'm totally. here. Um, so you talked about, we touched on bike locks. What actually happens if you rent a bike and it gets stolen? 
Oh, yeah. Um, they forgive you. <laughs> They're kind about it. Uh, they, if you rent a bike and it gets stolen, they understand. You are, you are liable. Um, so I, what that means is that you just, you don't, like, you don't get your money back or anything like that. Um, but these are all, for the most part, the bikes that you're renting are bikes that have been abandoned around campus, which means they've been left for more than three months and haven't been touched, um, like after students have left campus. Not just like, if you don't ride your bike for three months, it's not going to get commandeered, don't worry. Um, <laughs> but after students leave campus, we have a lot of leftover bikes. So the UVM Bikes Co-op takes them, fixes them up, and then rents them back to students. So for the most part, these are free bikes that they've gotten anyway. Um, so they're not, you know, they're not crying over it or anything. <laughs> Great. Um, I'm, do you mind if I ask you one more? Because I'm getting please. a few about this. Um, can you talk about cars on campus for freshmen? Yeah, so um, part of the reason we have a, a ban on cars for freshmen, um, there are exceptions for, for certain people, people who really need a car. Um, but for the most part, we don't allow cars on campus for freshmen. Part of that is because we want to encourage you to use all of the sustainable transportation options that I've just talked about. Part of it is also that we don't have a lot of capacity for parking lots on campus. We greatly value our green space. We greatly value having trees. We greatly value having space to put up new buildings so that you have places to hang out, places to learn, places to live. And we just don't necessarily have the space for more parking lots. Um, it's also to help encourage students to explore the downtown Burlington area. Students are a huge part of Burlington. Like when you're walking around, you're gonna see so many beautiful young faces of like all of you guys, all of you and your peers. So we want to use our influence in Burlington to help support local businesses because we're such a big presence here that we want to kind of give back in that way. So when people have cars, they tend to travel farther abroad and we want to kind of help people their first and second year really make a home on campus and in Burlington. We have so many other ways for you to get out and get around and take the bus and use car share. We're not like anti-car. We just um, like to have that kind of local focus for our freshmen. I also see a question in the chat about, do the buses go to the airport? Yes, they do. There's a specific bus line that goes to the airport. I believe it's the number 11. Um, and then also around breaks, UVM has extra buses that are running kids to and from the airport directly from campus, which is really cool. Um, and they do the same thing to the Amtrak train station in Essex. So if you're taking the train or if you're taking the bus, um, if you're taking the train or if you're taking a plane around breaks, there's specific UVM buses that will help you get there. Um, and some questions about car share, just because a few of them are coming in. Um, do you have to be a specific age to use car share and how much does a car share membership cost? Um, the cost itself, I don't know off the top of my head, I'm sorry, but I am sure it's available somewhere online if you just look up Car Share Vermont. Uh, you do have to be, you just have to have a driver's license, basically. Um, and then one thing you should know when you sign up for a membership is that they have, it's like a $30 one-time fee where they, it just pays for like a background check. So they want to make sure that you're not a crazy driver who's, you know, slammed into telephone poles and hit a bunch of people. They want to make sure that they're they're putting the keys in good hands. If you have a few speeding tickets or something like that, like I know I do, it happens. People aren't perfect. Um, that's fine. They're just looking to make sure that you're, you know, aren't aren't a super aggressive, crazy driver with a huge track sheet. Um, but that's the one thing is that there there will be an extra like thirty dollar fee just tacked on to the very first time you sign up for the membership, and you'll never see it again. Um, and then after that, it's an annual membership. But I don't know the exact number. I'm sorry. Um, Kate, I'm going to ask you another question. Um, buses that are free to students, did they go all the way out to Water Waterbury or Middlebury, or is it just directly in the like in this area? The buses do go out to, there is a Middlebury bus line. Um, I don't think it comes super frequently. I think it's like twice a day or something like that because it's a commuter line. Um, so it's like morning and evening, but yes, there is a bus. And if you go on just 
I don't know if it's .com or .org. I think it's .com. GMT.com, Green Mountain Transit. Um, their homepage has like a really nice, easy to use map that you can kind of zoom in and see where all the buses go. Or you could also do like the trip planner function on GMT.com and you just like type in where you want to go and where you're going from and it helps you. Sorry. Um, another thing that I'm just going to plug really quickly is that our office um, has been me and Kate have both worked on this bike guide. So another kind of plug for bikes. Um, it's a guide that shows you how to get to all of the best like natural areas around campus. Um, so it tells you about how long it would take to get there. It gives you the easiest route. The least steep route is what we consider the easiest. Um, and there's like 12 different routes. And then we have some maps in the guide too that show kind of all of the like natural areas around campus. Um, because we know that people really value outdoors, especially typically coming to UVM. There's people with a bit more of an outdoorsy focus. Uh, so we've put together this guide that hopefully you'll be seeing around campus and you can pick up a copy for free whenever you want. Not hearing Tegan have any other questions right now. Um, so I am going to jump in for the interest of time, but if you have any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll have a little bit more time um, at the end of this session. Thank you, Kate and Claire. I learned some amazing things as I am relatively new to UVM and Vermont. Um, I'm actually really excited about the bike guide, hearing about that, because one thing that I found slightly difficult is trying to find those hidden gems. So. If you've already got them mapped out with a least steep route, um, that sounds like my kind of jam. All right, I'm going to jump in a little bit now um, and forgive me, we've already passed the welcome and kind of what we're going to go over. Um, but for the rest of the time, we're gonna talk a little bit about what you can expect at orientation. And we have a few of our orientation leaders on, on this call. Um, we also call them OLs. And we're going to ask them a few questions about their orientation experience, maybe um, a couple sustainability questions, and then we're going to allow you all um, to ask any questions that you may have. And we'll try to address as many as we can um, with the interest of time. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what to expect. So hopefully by this point, you all know that orientation is going to be August 24th through the 28th. Now, um, there is a bit of an asterisk with that date because you all by now should know your moving date is either the 24th or the 25th of August. Um, one thing to know is that if you are moving in on the 25th, you aren't going to miss any of the orientation programs that happened on the 24th. We rotate everybody through. We have six teams going through orientation. So we make sure that you don't miss anything by moving in on that second day. Both on the 24th and on the 25th, you'll have an orientation welcome um, where you'll meet your orientation team, some more of your orientation leaders, um, and that'll follow move in at 3 p.m. We'll have some schedules posted soon with some more details and information on our orientation um, website, but for now, those are a couple of important things to keep in mind. So if you have family coming with you to help you move in, 3 p.m. is when you have to say goodbye, whether that's going to be really easy for you or if it's going to be a little bittersweet. So another thing to keep in mind, and you might have seen this um, lately in your emails from our office, is that important dates can always be found on our orientation roadmap on our website. Um, so the roadmap, if you scroll to the very bottom, has everything from May to August that we'll be doing. All of these sessions, all of these recordings, and everything upcoming is listed on there. And that's one way for us to try and give you all the information we can right up front. And we update that as often as we can as well. So that, and like I said, all virtual content leading up to August is on there. And I want to highlight a few exciting programs that you can look forward to um, before we get those details out to you. So a couple of things you can expect during orientation is a welcome from your College of School. So if you're in the College of Arts and Sciences or if you're in the um, 
center or the College for Education and Social Services. I think one of mine and Tegan's favorite welcomes is going to be the College of Agricultural and Life Sciences because you get to meet some of the animals. A um, little jealous about that. You'll have some time during orientation to meet with your advisors, to meet with the staff supporting you, and to meet some of your classmates as well. We also will have a career interest group mingler. So here soon you'll get some information on your checklist about a career interest survey that we'll be having you all take. That way you can get to know a little bit more about what are your strengths and what are your interests in your career field and how can the Career Center at UVM support you and help you engage with students who have similar interests to you. Um, so we'll have a little bit of information in that session. Some fun things maybe you can look up. Um, Playfair is one contract that we're very excited to bring to UVM. Um, we brought it to our incoming students last January and they absolutely loved it. Um, if you have some time and you feel like just Googling some things, I recommend you look up Playfair for college campuses. That way you can get a little bit of insight before the big day, but that's going to be a really fun time. We'll also have Rec the Night, which is our university um, rec center is going to be offering some classes for you all to participate in during orientation before all the incoming students come back. Uh, we'll have you doing some Zumba classes, maybe some biking if you're interested in that. They'll also have some drop in hours for volleyball and basketball. Um, just to give you some opportunities to get used to those spaces before everyone gets back to campus. We'll have some clubs and orgs come in, that way you can meet them, get to know them and maybe join a few. We'll have a really fun pep rally that athletics has planned because there's a big soccer game that Sunday. And right after that soccer game, there's going to be a one of UVM's, I think, best traditions, honestly, when it comes to um, incoming students would be convocation and twilight induction. Um, so this is every incoming student has this opportunity to get together and, you know, really celebrate the fact that this is a big step in your journey in your education. Um, hear from hear from some amazing speakers and just feel like that big community coming together before classes start the next day. A little bit more about orientation, um, our orientation leaders. So if you don't know already, and I've tried to highlight them on our social medias, you'll see a little plug at the bottom. But if you want to get a jump start in meeting some of your orientation leaders, definitely follow us on Instagram because I try to highlight them every week. Um, but our orientation leaders are going to be your mentors on everything orientation. We have a few of them here with us today that I'll let speak in just a moment, um, but you'll be working with them throughout orientation. And one of the things that you all will be doing is competing actually throughout orientation. Um, so we have six teams, red, orange, gold, green, blue, and purple. There's no yellow because our co school colors are green and gold. Um, and you all will be divided based on your learning communities into one of those teams. And throughout the weekend, you'll be competing to earn points. And we'll have this giant game show on Sunday where one team will win the opportunity um, to be entered into a raffle to win some really great prizes that our office has purchased in hopes that you all will really participate throughout the weekend because we have some great things for you. We have 160 orientation leaders so there's bound to be someone that can help you and give you some insight on maybe some of the questions you have. And one thing that I've been really excited to highlight um, this year is that our 2022 orientation leaders collectively represent eight countries, 20 states, and DC. So we have people coming from all walks of life. They have different interests. They have different experiences because we want them to really represent you all the incoming class and be able to give some insight that could help you in your journey. So I've talked a little bit and I'm sure Tegan has some questions, um, but before we go any further, I'd really love to give 
our orientation leaders the opportunity to introduce themselves um, that they're on the call tonight. We only have a few, not all, not all 160 are here. Um, but if we could do a popcorn style, because I can't see the screen, um, I'm gonna put Ryan on the spot. Could you introduce yourself, um, your name, maybe your major, where you're from, um, and just a little fun fact, um, hello everyone. I am Ryan Malkowski. My pronouns are he, him. Uh, I'm going to be a sophomore in the fall and I'm from Lancaster, Massachusetts, and I am majoring in biology. And fun fact, probably one of my favorite things to do around Burlington is to go to North Beach and Lone Rock. Good spots. Ryan, could you popcorn another orientation leader? Uh, I'll popcorn to Kate Marion. Hi guys, I'm Kate. I use she, her pronouns. I'm from Westchester, Pennsylvania, and I'm majoring in business administration in the Grossman School of Business. Um, a fun fact about me is my favorite activity to do at school is hammock. And I call it the Redstone Forest, but there's a bunch of different names that people call it. All popcorn to Ellie. Hi guys, uh, I'm Ellie. I'm an upcoming sophomore. I'm an environmental sciences major. Uh, oh, I use they, them pronouns. Um, a fun fact about me is this year I'm gonna be a trek leader as well. So if you guys have any good questions on that, uh, I'd love to help. Uh, I'll popcorn to Allie. Hi, I'm Allie. I use she, her pronouns. I'm from Doylestown, Pennsylvania, and I am majoring in environmental studies and uh, poli sci. And a fun fact about me is that I play saxophone and clarinet. So if you have any questions about the music program, just let me know. Okay. Am I missing an orientation leader? Again, I can't see the screen. Okay, it sounds like that was everyone. Thank you all for introducing yourselves. Um, before we move on, I think we have just 15 more minutes here. Um, are there any questions, Tegan, for our orientation leaders in the chat that we should address? Sorry, I'm, I'm working my way through them. Y'all are asking <laughs> questions very quickly and I'm trying to keep up. Um, so a question um, one of the orientation leaders or for orientation leaders, maybe you could answer, does the UVM shuttle go to the barn um, where the equestrian team practices? Um, it doesn't, but there's a there's like a bike path that goes to the farms. Um, me and my friends always go see the cows and it's really easy to find. It's right behind the Patrick gym and it crosses behind the track. It's just like a bike walking path, but not a shuttle. Thank you. And then for Ellie, there's actually a few questions for you about which <laughs> track you're leading. Um, so as of right now, they haven't told us exactly, but I'm leading a service track and hopefully fingers crossed doing Habitat for Humanity, which I did um last year but i can answer pretty much any question about um any of the treks because we went through all the training we did it all together um but if you are doing trek it's an amazing opportunity and i've heard nothing but good things about every single trip and you'll you'll make friends that will stick throughout the rest of college which i think is really nice just to have coming in like knowing a group of like 10 to 12 people like just having that solid balance i think is a great way to start your year Okay, I'm also, yeah, I'm also seeing a lot of questions in the chat about where we find our move-in date. Um, so your move-in date was actually sent to you already um, via email on the email where you learned about your learning community. So when you got your learning community assignment, it should have also said the date that your move-in was. 
If you don't know your move-in date, please feel free to send an email to orientation at uvm.edu and we can support you in that process. We'll also be having um, some upcoming sessions at the end of July and throughout August with the Residence Life that will help you prepare um, for those big moments. But definitely look for the email prior to that because it's nice to have that information. Keegan, while you, oh, go ahead. I have another question. Are there any drawbacks to moving in on the second day of the 25th? No, yep, that's one thing that we, great question. One thing that we really thought hard about. Um, the really cool thing about your incoming class is you are record breakers. We've never had an incoming class this large before. Um, and so one way to really make sure that we're having, you know, a authentic, um, intentional conversations with you all and making sure that you're getting the information you need as you go throughout orientation. Um, we thought really hard about that and so we knew we had to split the move in in between two days, um, but we wanted to make sure that no information was lost. There were no downsides to moving in on that second day. So anyone moving in on the 24th, I'm sorry, you don't get anything extra special. Um, everyone on the 25th will have the same exact experience just a little bit later. Fantastic question. And Tegan, while you run those up, I, I, I have a few for our, I had our orientation leaders prepare um, and I'll just have you all kind of popcorn again. That way we can highlight you and everyone can see your face. But I'll, I'll start with um, Ellie this time. Can you? Um, tell us one of your favorite orientation memories, maybe something that our incoming students can look forward to. I really enjoyed the night of orientation where they put on, uh, they just like have a lot of things going on for the freshmen to just get out of the dorm and do things. And I think it's really nice because it's a time where no one knows anybody and you will make friends for like the rest of school. Like I met one of my best friends standing in line to make a stuffed duck. I had no idea who they were beforehand, but like that's just kind of how you make friends. And it's a very like fun night. There are things everywhere. Like I know my roommates went to the science disco. There was like a drag queen like dancing in our amphitheater. Like it, I think it was just like a very unique, fun experience to like really kind of shake the nerves of like starting college. Do you want me to popcorn to someone or? Yeah, I think that's a great example too. So if you want a popcorn, I feel like that's awesome. I'll go to Kate. Katie. Um, my favorite moment from orientation, it's probably the same thing as Ellie's. It's the, um, the first couple of nights that we were there. They had karaoke in Brennan's, which was so much fun. And you would win prizes and stuff if, um, it was a raffle and you would win prizes. And yeah, there was a silent disco, which was really fun. And they also got, it's so stupid, but they had like this hungry hippo setup thing that was really fun. Um, it was it was a it was great the week of welcome. Um, I can popcorn alley. Yeah, I loved like the first nights they were awesome, but I think my favorite was Twilight induction because at that point I already had like met some people and then it just we ended up taking like a really cute picture with like candles and stuff and it was you could feel the community that night and it was awesome seeing everyone together and it just it like made you feel like yeah I'm at UVM and I'm ready to do this so that was super fun and uh, Popcorn Ryan. <laughs> uh, mine is the same as Allie's, the Twilight and Convocation ceremony. Um, I met some of my like best friends there through the, the kid living next to us this past year, and it was just a good time. The Waterman Green is a great place, and just to see your entire class all there is just amazing. Uh, Ryan or Ali, could you talk a little bit for maybe um, those who don't know what the convocation and induction twilight is? Could you talk a little bit more about it? Yeah. Throw me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> so the convocation, they started, um, I think we're in front of Davis, and then they had like the president spoke and they brought in some other people. So they talked about like their UVM experience. And then from there, we did kind of like this march and all the clubs were like lined up on the side. So you could see like a bunch of different activities that you could do. And then you got to the Waterman Green and they kind of did this like chant and everyone like lit the candles at the same time. 
Yeah. And, and you um, agree to uphold uh, the community standards during the twilight induction ceremony, correct? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think it is a really cool um, opportunity and all incoming students will get a really cool shirt that we, um, that represents your learning community. And so you really like, I think, both Ryan and Ali have explained like you really feel the community during that event before you go into into college. Um, my second question and then I'll I'll hand it over to all of the student questions that Tegan's kind of gathering. Um, I think this is a really good one and I asked Ryan to share it with me already so I'll start with him. Um, what is one thing that you brought to college that you didn't need? We were talking about sustainability earlier, so we kind of want to kind of want to share what might not have been that important. So Ryan, could you provide a little bit? Um, so this may be kind of unexpected, but it, for me, it was a coffee maker. So I drink a lot of coffee, as probably many of you do, but I never use it. I just had it when I went to the dining halls for breakfast with my roommates, but it was just one thing that I thought I would use all the time and I never used it, but yeah. Oh, I'll popcorn <laughs> to uh, Ellie. Um, I think for me, I like wildly underpacked because I was in a triple. Um, so I think also watching for that. But the one thing I did do was pack an immense amount of sweatshirts, um, which I did not end up needing. I think you should get like a core like five to seven and cut it off I think I probably brought about 12 to 14 sweat sweatshirts so just watching how much clothes you need and bring clothes that like you can easily layer and like can use for multiple things and on the other end of that don't forget to bring some cold weather gear um, if you're not going to be going home before Christmas break or winter break, um, definitely make sure you have some cold weather gear. So, uh, Allie or um, Kate, do you have anything that you want to share that you maybe didn't need? I can't see y'all. Um. <laughs> Like basically the same thing as Ellie. I was in a force triple too, so I underpacked, but so many clothes I just didn't wear. Cause you think you're gonna go to college and wear them, but if you don't wear them now, you're not gonna wear them in college. Yeah, I brought this like shoe rack organizer thing and I hung it from my bed, but I never used it. And I just put shoes like in the closet. So if you don't tend to like use a shoe rack organizer, don't buy it. <laughs> I think one of the other things um, that Tegan um, and our office and myself and I saw at the end of the year, there are donation bins in the halls um, to hopefully, you know, collect some of those those items that still can still can be used that students might not want anymore. Um, we saw a few things. A shoe rack was one of them. Um, maybe a lap desk. You most likely won't need that. There's libraries. There are desks in the common areas, plenty of places to study. I, I don't think you might need that um, lap desk. And then a lot of rugs. So I'm not sure if that was um, very popular, um, but if you're not gonna clean it, you might not need it. Any questions, Tegan? I kind of run through the questions I had for the OLs. Any questions from the incoming students for our orientation leaders? Yes, there are, um, and orientation leaders, you um, can grab these as you'd like. You don't all have to answer the question, but um, so my first question that I'm gonna pose to y'all is, whoo, hang on, there's a lot of them. How does ordering packages work to my dorm? I can do this one. Um, so, I ordered a couple things, not as many as other people, but it was really simple. You can find the address of your like building. I'm pretty sure in the main desk, they have the address. 
And like I ordered from Amazon a lot and you just type that in as the shipping address and they deliver it to the building. And then once the like the building gets it, the main desk sends you an email that like, oh, you received a package. Then you go up to the front desk and you grab your package. It's very simple. Great. Thank you. Um, is there storage for skis and snowboards? Anybody? Anybody? I can take this <laughs> one, but to my knowledge, I think I've just stored mine in my room. Um, I know some people have snuck them into the bike rooms, um, so then they're locked, but you're supposed to just keep them like in your dorm. I kept my skis in my closet. They fit sideways, but it's kind of on you. I will say I knew someone whose skis got stolen out of the bank room, so I wouldn't. Re I just recommend keeping them where you can have eyes on them. <laughs> um, a lot of times after skiing and snowboarding, we would leave our um, skis in the hallways to dry and then we would bring them in. I put mine under my bed. So just to kind of like keep space. Great. Um, can we talk about how are the club sports at UVM? I can do this one. I do club running, which is a little it's a little less strict of a club team, but I think all the club teams are pretty amazing. It's a great way to get out and like continue doing something you love, but like a little a lot less of the pressure of like a normal like team like at our school I think it's fun you get to travel I know our soccer team have traveled pretty far to go play some games like, I think it's a really great way to like get out there and like keep yourself like active while still like meeting new people any other big questions Tegan must have items to bring to college Ooh, that's a good one. I think for me, I'll answer. Um, I had a tiny fan that I was able to clip to the top of my bed because in the beginning and very end of the year, your dorms get hot, very hot. So you will need a fan to like, that was the only thing that kept me sleepy at night was um, my fan. So I'd recommend getting at least one that you can put somewhere close to near your bed so it keeps you cool at night. I can also do this one for me. I lived in a four triple, as many of the other OLs. Um, and we did not organize our shoes very well. So we got a shoe rack and it helped organize our room a lot because we would just leave our shoes just on the floor and they would kind of just be a mess. So the shoe rack helped a lot for us. If you're in like a four triple, it could save a lot of space. Ryan, did you share that or did like each of you didn't purchase one, did you? <laughs> no, we shared it. We got it after we moved in and shared it. So like some of the sho other shoes that we didn't use all the time went in there. But yeah. OK. Tiga, any other big ticket question? It'll be our last one. Is there a common one? I'm looking, I'm looking to see because the thread's kind of going on for a while. <laughs> um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Okay. Um, when do you get cat cards? Ooh, that is a great question. Um, so hopefully soon you'll get some information again on your checklist. Sorry, OLs, I'm jumping in for this one. <laughs> You'll get some information soon on your new student checklist um, that talks a little bit about your cat card and uploading your photo. And sometime during that first weekend during orientation, we will have everyone go and pick up their cat card. Um, and so, you know, your orientation leaders will help you out with that. They'll find a time maybe during some team time to gather everybody and head in that direction to pick them up. So you'll get those when you get to campus. 
And um, if that, that's a, oh. I just wanted to say, you can put your cat card <laughs> on your phone and it's really, it makes things so much easier. So you can, they'll send you an email about that too, but it's really nice. Yes. Yeah, definitely recommend the mobile cat card. Um, and, and the instructions will definitely talk about that. Um, so that is our last question. We've gone over a little bit tonight. Um, if you have any other questions and you followed us on Instagram, I've peeked a couple times during the session and saw that a, a good number of you have followed us. Um, on our story right now, we are accepting questions that you have for your orientation leaders. Um, and if you want to put in some of those last minute questions, we can collect them throughout the night. And then tomorrow we'll um, have some answers on those for you on our story. Um, but I think that's all we have for you tonight. Definitely thank you to the Office of Sustainability for coming and speaking about dining and waste and transportation. I think those are all very important things to know before our students come to campus. Thank you to our OLs for being here and for sharing some information. Um, I hope you all enjoyed this time. Our next session will be July 11th, and that's going to be on Burlington and beyond. That'll be all, um, all orientation leaders just talking about their experiences here in Burlington, maybe some study abroad, maybe some fun adventures, and we can answer any questions that you have during that time there as well. If you have anything super pressing, please feel free to reach out to UVM orientation or orientation at uvm.edu. They send all your emails to you, so you, you should know the address by now. Um, and we'll be happy to answer those for you. And if you have anything fun to ask the OLs, again, that question box is on our Instagram. I think that's all we have for you for tonight. Thank you for coming and we will see you on July 11th.